My goal in this video is to help you understand bones of garments. If you took the bones out of your body, would you stand up? Would there be any structure left to you? You would just crumble and fall, right? Well, it's the same thing with garments. We've got edges that need to be stabilized. We've got parts of them that need to have more oomph, like collars and cuffs, center fronts. You can't put a buttonhole and just two layers of fabric without interfacing in it to stabilize that buttonhole. They're just places where you have to understand that it needs structure. And we give garments structure with interfacing. And it's not only garments, it's our crafty type sewing. It's purses, it's um, like the batting in a quilt. There's all kinds of things, um, pieces of fabric, these strips of things that give structure to our sewing project. There's also a difference between interfacing and fusing agents. Interfacing can be sewn in or it can be fused in. But a fusing agent like steam a seam or stitch witchery, that is like a a fabric piece that's glue that's going to hold two pieces together. It's going to fuse two pieces of fabric and make them as one. All right? That is not interfacing. It may well make those fabrics stiffer, but it is not technically interfacing. So in this video, my goal is to try to explain the difference and my favorite products. I have gathered all of this in an $8 PDF available at my website called Interfacing Demystified. This will be 28 pages if you print it out all about my favorite interfacings. So you might want to check into that. Let's get started to demystify interfacing. Did you see that picture that Melanie sh just shot of me that I put into this video? That was me searching in my interfacing stash for what a lot of people purchase for interfacing that I just don't allow into my sewing room. <laughs> and that is non-woven, non-knitted, felted, I hate to say the word Pellon, but that's the brand that is kind of known as the term. If you can take what you think is interfacing and rip it, it is not going to last in your garment. That's one thing I learned in my college studies and getting my home ec degree. I had a professor who did her, her doctorate studies in interfacings and how they hold up in garments, both ready-made and custom-made. And just a strong lesson I learned from her was that interfacings without structure, not knitted, not woven, not a weft, but just mushed together, if you can tear them, they're going to disintegrate in your garment. That's why I couldn't find any of that interfacing here in my sewing studio. So never put that in the garment. I would never let anybody, any student of mine, put a non-woven in a garment. Now maybe in a purse or some kind of crafty item, but not in a garment that's gonna be washed and dried. These are in my stabilizer stash, not in my interfacing stash. Now Londa, is that the stuff that they use for tear away with embroidery? Yes, that's exactly it. But it's also marketed as interfacing. Now they're really two different things, but that's its lack of structure. And I have that, do you see? It tears, this is a tear away stabilizer. Stabilizers for embroidery are not the same thing as interfacing. No, 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 no. Interfacing can either be sew-in or fusible, as I said in the past. And I like structured interface. There are many, many, many ones to choose from, but here's one of my absolute favorites. This is a woven, non-fusible interfacing. If I were gonna be a real nice wife and make my husband a shirt, which would be a real labor of love, um, I would use this in the collar and the cuffs and down the center front where the buttonholes go. This happens to be by the Pellon Company. It's a manufacturer of interfacings. It's called Woven Sew-In. It is machine wash warm. It 55 cotton and 45 polyester and made in the USA. How about that? Now, cotton and polyester, that's gonna shrink. So that brings me to another point that I really make a strong, strong point of in my document that you can purchase. Fabric that you make into a garment must be pre-shrunk. That means you wash it and you dry it, just like you're gonna do after you make the garment. So if you didn't wash and dry what goes into it, it might shrink, right? 
So you must, you must, you must pre-shrink the interfacing as well. It just occurred to me as I was talking about pre-shrinking interfacing that I had a wonderful example and I apologize that it's all wrinkled but I keep it handy here in the studio so that I can prove to my students that pre-treating interfacing is just as important as pre-treating the fabric. This is a little sailor collar top that I'd made for my daughter and it was just going to be so cute. I know it was for my daughter because the buttonholes are in the right side. Women's things lap right over left. Anyway. I knew I wanted to put a sew-in interfacing in this because it was going to go in the washer and dryer a lot. She was going to wear this a lot. And I didn't want that bubbly quality that you can get sometimes with fusibles if you don't fuse it in right. So that's what I put in here. But can you see now, do you see all the extra collar there is? Look how much extra on both the upper collar and the under collar. That's because the interfacing between the upper collar and the under collar shrunk. So this is never going to lay together right. Never, never, never. You may have tried to iron your husband's shirts and the inside of the collar just is, uh, it's got excess to it. What's happened is that the interfacing has shrunk. Do you think for one minute that they pre-shrink fabric in the factories before they cut out the garments? Or that they pre-shrink the interfacing when they cut out the interfacing? Oh no, they certainly don't. So that's another reason for sewing to get your things to look better and last longer. So that was proof that sew-in interfacing needs to be pre-shrunk. But I also have a wonderful example in here on the facings. I knew in that collar I wanted to use the sew-in, but heck, on the facings I thought I'll just use a fusible. And I used a woven fusible interfacing but do you see how it's bubbling? Can you see that? Isn't it obvious that the interfacing shrunk when this garment was washed? And that's what created all of these little bubbles. Now granted, it's on the inside of the garment, so it's not the end of the world, but that's what's gonna happen if you don't pre-shrink your interfacings. So a rule of thumb should be that you never, ever, 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 ever bring interfacings into your sewing room, your sewing studio, your sewing storage until they've gone to your laundry room first. And we'll talk more about how you do that. As I got out those samples from here in the studio, I came across this little top that I had started to make as well to prove that another um, purpose of interfacing is to make a part of a garment more opaque. Do you see on this side of the collar that you can see the seam allowance part of that piping? Doesn't that shadow through? So in this case, I had put the interfacing on the under collar. However, instead, if I put that interfacing on the upper collar, do you see how it makes this more opaque and you don't see that shadow of the seam allowance of that sweet little piping coming through? So in general, on garments that I know are going to be washed a lot, and as tiny as this is, this little tyke would definitely get dribbles and stuff on this collar. It would be washed a lot and probably hot. I would use a sew-in interfacing over a fusible interfacing, hands down, all right? If you don't want to have any chance of bubbles, pre-shrink your interfacing and use a sew-in interfacing. That's my rule of thumb. And then another sew-in that I really, really love is silk organza. This is very sheer and it's 100% silk. No, you're not going to find it at your local chain store. Just you'll have to uh, Google for it and order it online. I'm sure that Exotic Silks has it. I used to carry it. I don't any longer, but this just has a crispness to it and it's very lightweight. This is a wonderful interfacing for something really lightweight, like a, a sheer um, chiffon or some kind of a, a pretty silk blouse. This would be a great interfacing. If you were doing tailoring, you might also want to consider um, hair canvas, but in that you would be doing all the hand pad stitching and I really don't know many people who do typical tailoring any longer. I even graduated to using fusibles in my tailoring years back when I was doing that. So let's proceed now to my favorite fusible interfacings and again these are my favorite ones. We have that same woven structure with sticky on the back, okay? So you can tell this side is rough and this side is smooth. So this is the side that goes down. Now there's specific directions for fusing as well, but before I digress, 
even fusible interfacings should be pre-shrunk. Now, Melanie, do you think that you should throw fusible interfacings into the washer and dryer? No, it'll wash the glue off. It would wash the glue off, and what glue didn't get washed off, you would have a stuck together mess, right? So this is how you do it. You fold it up, and you put it in a sink where you have run as hot a water as you can get. And you lay it in that sink of hot water, and you let it stay there until the water is cool. Then you take it out, and you roll it in a towel, and you just let it lay there for a little while, and then you don't hang it over a shower rod. Instead, you lay it out flat on that towel and let it dry. That's how I would pre-shrink this woven interfacing, and it's also how I would pre-shrink knit fusible interfacings. All right? So it's, it's the same shrinking business. You've got to pre-shrink your fusible interfacings as well as your non-fusible interfacings. So I, I trust I've made a strong point of that. Okay, so fusibles, we have a woven structure, and then we also have a knitted structure. Now this is a tri-dimensional, eight-way stretch knit. So a knit interfacing is obviously great in knit fabrics. It's still giving it some extra oomph, some extra body, but it still has some give. So this again is sticky on one side and not on the other. You can get that kind of interfacing in what I call an eight-way stretch, which is what this is. It's an eight-way stretch fusible tricot. This is made by Bosal, B-O-S-A-L. This very same knit fusible tricot is what I fused to all of the silk outer pieces of this silk dress. And doing that just gave it such a nice crisp look Without this, it would be just kind of really soft. This is a dress that I wore at my sister's wedding when I was being an attendant, and it had to get packed in a suitcase, and I knew, knew I was going to be wearing it for a long time that day, and it just stayed looking perfect because I had actually changed the character of the fabric by fusing to it. But do you see this has been cleaned a couple of times, and there's no bubbles, right? So the bubbles come from two reasons. It comes from not pre-shrinking it, but it also comes from not fusing it well. We'll talk about fusing it well and properly in just a minute. There's yet one more fusible interfacing that I keep in my stash that I want to draw to your attention, and that's what's called textured weft. It really just have, has a stabilizing thread that goes through the crosswise direction. Uh, I've used this a lot in tailoring, and in tailoring you can use different interfacings and you can use duplicate layers of interfacing to create rolls and, and heavier areas in jacket. But textured weft is one that's mentioned in my document that you can purchase, and it also is one that I really like. I would just caution you that it seems to me that when I'm fusing this, the sticky comes up through the right side. So when I use textured weft, I'm always putting a press cloth over top to protect the sole of my iron. Some more fusible interfacings that I really like, especially for my crafty type sewing, and we do a lot of that here in the studio with cotton fabrics as I'm teaching new sewers. This is called fusible fleece. So if we were making a purse or something, it, it adds a little bit of loft but yet it's going to stick in place. And it's just easier for beginning sewers to fuse things rather than having separate layers to deal with. More along the craft line, there's this, which is called Peltex or Timtex. This is so stiff. This is the kind of thing that's in brims of hats or in some tote bags. All right, there's even interfacings that are foam. Okay, that you can actually sew into garments. So there's a whole new realm of all of these different products that add structure to your work. And you simply cannot skip them and have the same quality end product. Next, I'm gonna show you how we actually fuse fusible interfacings on. I never buy interfacing just in how much the pattern calls for. That's gonna be a total waste of your money. Buy it in at least two to three yard hunks determine which ones are your favorites, and hopefully this will help you determine that, and then buy two, three, four yard hunks, pre-shrink it, and you will be much more economical as you cut out your pattern pieces that require interfacing. 
This is the proper technique to actually fuse interfacings. Number one, you need a really good steam iron or even a press. A steamer will not do it. You need the, the weight of an iron, all right? And you need steam, so make sure it's filled with water, but don't go past the maximum line. Proper fusing is heat, steam, and pressure. Now the other thing you need to realize is that on the sole plate of all steam irons are those holes where the steam comes through. So when this is down against the surface, is there pressure where those holes are? No, there's not any pressure. So you can't just hold the iron down in one place and think that it's all fused. It's not. You have to keep moving your iron around and doing it. And as you do it, you really need to hold it down add some additional pressure and you have to count to 10. All right, count to 10. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. Okay, so how I do it is I get my fabric warm in the first place so I have no wrinkles. Then I lay down my fusible interfacing making sure that it's not sticking out over because I don't want to get that gooey on my ironing board cover either. And then one Mississippi, two Mississippi with lots of pressure, move it. This is boring and it takes a while. Have a podcast to listen to or something. And then you're not done. Then you have to turn it over and do the same thing from the other side. And if you're fusing one of these heavier fusible wefts, it's really easier for that heat, steam, and pressure to get through from this side than it is through all of that loft from the other side. So what I'm saying to you, I hope you hear me strongly, is that it takes time and effort to fuse properly. But if you do, and you pre-shrink your fusible interfacings, you pre-shrink all interfacings, you should have so much more success with your garments. So that concludes my little sermonette here on fusible interfacings. And again, I have a 26-page document that you can purchase and print out for yourself so you will have all of this handy to read through all of the nitty gritty. I obviously haven't shared 26 pages worth of information. I have exactly how you fuse on, that you don't fuse over seam allowances, uh, that you put things on the upper public side of garments. There's more to interfacing than what I've shared with you. You never fuse over seam allowances. You put interfacing in hem allowances. All that good stuff is waiting for you in my Interfacing Demystified PDF. Find the link below.